Our text today is a continuation of the series entitled Pentecost. This is a wonderful season. This is a wonderful time of year. This is one of the perhaps most exciting times of the year for me. And I want it to be an exciting time for you because we're in the season of Pentecost. We're preparing for, and with great anticipation and excitement, the return or rather the celebration of the inaugural arrival, the initial arrival, that momentous moment when the Holy Spirit was given uh, to the apostles and to the disciples at the time following Jesus Christ's reascension or ascension back to heaven. This is a glorious time and somebody should know that you understand what this season is about in celebrating. So I want to speak in simple terms today. I want to speak in terms that will allow you to walk out of these doors and have something, a nugget of truth to share with somebody, to tell them why we go to church during this season and what this season, Pentecost season, is all, all, all about. In our text today, you heard the words as, as commanded by Jesus, wait for the promise, wait for the promise. We have 29 days, and it's 29 days and counting before we celebrate Pentecost. Can we just bless God just a little bit? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. 29 days and counting, amen. 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the return back to heaven, the ascension of the, Jesus back to the Father on the right hand of the throne of heaven, the Holy Ghost was promised and the promise was kept, amen. You might remember in the Old Testament, the Bible spoke of the Holy Spirit as uh, setting upon, setting upon or falling upon a certain one, such as Samson when he was... Uh, up against the Philistines or, or, or David when, when he was in battle or, or Gideon when he was in battle. But today and during grace and truth in this dispensation, the church age, the Holy Spirit does not just set upon, it rests on. Somebody say rests on. Rest on. It rests on and indwells our heart. It rests on us and indwells our heart. It is a powerful phenomenon that, ha that happens to one who believes on Jesus Christ. In fact, it is the first work of grace in the heart of a believer. It is the acceptance of Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, your personal Lord and Savior. And when you do that, and you mean it from your heart, and you confess it from your mouth, the Bible says that his spirit indwells your heart. So see, you know, I know that you've, how many have been going to church at least for 10 years? Amen. Amen. And so you've seen people, as I've said before, you've seen people demonstrate what they say is, is, is the spirit. You know, they get, they get that jerk and, 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 they, and they act like, you know, something hit them and maybe something did. I don't know. But, you know, after that jerk, you got to live something. You know, that jerk is good. And, and you know, and they say, oh, you know, and, and, and it seems that that's going down from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. But the truth of the matter is that same person watch their life when they walk out the door. Mm -hmm. The jerk is not enough to keep you. The Holy Spirit is not so much about what you feel, but about what you believe. Amen. amen somebody. Amen. Somebody say amen. 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 It's about what you believe. It's about what you receive from God. It's about what indwells you. Amen. Now, his presence is powerful, and it sometimes causes an emotional response. But all in all, I want you to realize that all too often the devil tricks the people of God in thinking that you got to feel something in order to be saved. I see nowhere in the Bible, Elder, where that's true where you got to feel something or you have to see something in order to be saved. You must believe. Amen. For by grace are we saved through faith, that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. If we can but believe, we have to believe. It is necessary that we believe. So then the Holy Spirit was given once. Somebody say just one time. Yes, one time. The Holy Spirit is not ever going to be given again. It was given one time. Now it's up to us to receive it. It can be received any day, any moment, by anyone who wishes to receive. But God gave it one time, and that was on the day of Pentecost. And when it arrived, it was here for once and forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. So then it has been given just once, and it arrived just once. Now, now why did it, it, it arrive? It arrived to rest on us and to dwell in our hearts as believers and to baptize us spiritually. Why? 
Why does the Holy Spirit rest on us and, and dwell within us and, and baptizes us? It does it to empower us for effective witness. Amen. Effective witness. You might think of, think of a moment when you have cried out to God, perhaps, that someone will be saved, or you were crying out to somebody in particular and, and wanting them to be saved, but you realize that, that your efforts were not efficacious. You, you didn't get the kind of results that you wanted. Oftentimes that happens because the Bible says, except God does the drawing, we cannot be drawn. And when we utter from our mouth the word of God and reach out to soul win and spread the gospel, which is the good news, it must be the work of the Holy Spirit that does the work in the heart. Amen. The Bible says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into what? One body. The body of what? The body of Christ. Notice that in the word of God, it was following and only after the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension, which means the return of Jesus back to heaven. It was only after the death, after the burial, after the resurrection, and after the ascension of Jesus Christ back to the throne of his father did the Holy Spirit come. Hmm. Why is that? Jesus had told them, he said, I must go that he, the Holy Spirit, might come. Yeah. Yeah. He had promised in St. John chapter 16, verse 13, chapter 16, verse 13, he said, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. It was only after Jesus left the earth, after he died, buried, rose, and went back up to heaven, could indeed the Holy Spirit have its place. For Jesus had promised that another comforter, in the Greek, the paraclete, one who stands alongside, one who supports, one who uh, aids one in their work, in their call. So Jesus had told them that he would pray to his father, that he would send somebody else, yes. that he would send another personality. And it is a personality. It is a person, the Holy Spirit himself, Amen. to comfort them. Amen. For God indeed is the God Amen. of all comfort. And Jesus said, I must go for he, the Holy Spirit, uh, in order for him to come. So Pentecost, here's the connection. Here's the point I want you to get. Pentecost could not have occurred without the cross. When you look at the pattern and the sequence of things happen, it, it, in other words, if Jesus had not died, was buried and rose again and went back to heaven, Pentecost couldn't have occurred. Why? Because the Holy Ghost couldn't have come. All right? So then the Holy Ghost came as a result of Jesus completing his work here on earth. We need to examine our own lives. Where are we on the spectrum of completing or doing what God has called us to do? Am I spending 90% of my time pleasing George? Am I pursuing things that will simply make me happy, will give me status and acclaim in the earth? Am I doing things that when I stand before God, I will be able to boldly stand before him with confidence that I have pleased him? Or will I go schemishly before him, holding my head down because I know that my, old, my whole and entire pursuit in life was to get what I wanted? Church, we must make sure that we understand our purpose because God has given us the Holy Spirit to empower us, to equip us, to enable us to be successful. So if you're having dumb days, if you find yourself going in the same valley, living in the same wilderness, going around and around and around and not making any progress, it might be that you're off course with the purpose that God has assigned to your hand. Now, our anchor scripture again says, wait on the promise. Now, Wait, to wait is not just a virtue. It's not just a moral strength. Mm -hmm. To wait is to understand that there is a divinely appointed set time, a divine command with a promise. God has commanded some stuff, but with that command is attached a promise. When you wait on God, you must understand that God will keep his promises. He never, ever fails on a promise made. Now, remember what I said last Sunday about what weight means? I want to add this to it. I want you to understand that, that, that weight is connected to a universal biblical principle. From Genesis to Malachi in the Old Testament and from Matthew to Revelation in the New Testament, or in the, in the Old Testament with, with Malachi and through Revelation in the New Testament, the Lord 
has shown something, and you can connect the dots in the, in, in the word. And I've connected the dots for you, and I want to show you a universal principle that operates in the word of God. I've already alluded to it already. Here it is. The promises of God are scheduled for a set time, a divinely appointed time. So what is to wait on God? Now, wait does not mean pause and see what happens next. That's what a lot of people equate wait with. Wait, biblically speaking, does not mean to pause and see what happens next. No, wait in the sight of God means that that we honor and acknowledge God as sovereign, that he is providential. He not only created things, but he upholds and sustains. In other words, God is just in control. How many believe God's in control? Amen. Amen. What God wants from us is a submissive, receptive, believing heart. And we'll be surprised what you walk in. Lady Michelle and I are walking in some things now that I wish I had just got my act together about 15 years ago for. Amen. And started really believing God and stepping out of my comfort zone. As long as you got to see it, as long as somebody else got to tell you that it's going to be and you can't trust God for yourself, you'll find yourself walking slowly if ever even receiving some of the things that God wants to give to you. So to wait on God is not only to acknowledge his sovereignty and his providential hand. To wait on God is to confidently rest and to believe in his plan for your life and his timing for your life. It's to rest confidently in God's plan for your life and in God's timing for your life, to to know that he has it in control. It is to be able to say what the author said in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, we have the petitions that we ask of him. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask any, somebody say anything, If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, then we have the petition. You've heard that scripture, Hebrews 11 and 1. I want to break it down in two parts because sometimes it's too difficult to understand reading the whole thing. Faith is the substance. Stop right there because faith is a two-part thing to find in Hebrews 11 and 1, right? Faith is is the substance of things hoped for. So then, what are you hoping for? What do you believe in God for? Your faith materializes it. Faith is the substance, the very thing that you hope for and desire for. In other words, we must learn to equate what we can believe God for with what is there for us. What's the second part of Hebrews 11 and 1? Faith is the evidence. It is the evidence of things not seen. So then your faith is evidence that what you don't see is a reality in the spirit realm. The very fact that you say, I believe God for it. Your, Your faith is the evidence of the thing not seen. We all too often Live like we got to see it. But after a service last week, and I got to, I, I, I don't know if I told you all about this, but, but at the 8 o'clock and the 9.30, I shared this. Pete, let's do it again. Go to that wall, please. Amen. I, I want you all to see this. The, the Lord just dropped a nugget in my truth, uh, in my spirit, and it so profoundly impacted me. I was riding in the car when the Lord showed it to me. And I, and I just want you for a moment to imagine that something that you need from God stands as a door. Okay, the door is wide open. Doors wide open. And, 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 and you, it might be a financial need. It may be a healing need. It may be a promotion. It may be a job. It may be a home. Uh, something in your life. Go ahead and close the door, Pete. What well, the Lord showed me. And, and it was so powerful, I wanted to run. And I was in the car and couldn't even run. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I, 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 mean, I, I mean, it became so clear to me. The Lord said, I know when you can, when you really have faith in me. Mm-hmm. I, I, it, was, it was so clear. It wasn't an audible voice, but, but I could just feel what the Lord was saying, Mike. I, I knew God was talking to me. He said, I know when you really got faith in me. When you got faith in me, you don't just passively walk toward something. Because, see, a lot of times we are looking with our eyes at that closed door. 
And so we walk and we back up some and, and, and we die and say, oh, we, we, we turn away and, and uh, then, then sometimes we go to church and we get an encouraging word like today and, and you look at that, you look down there again and you know God done told you he's going to supply your need, that he's going to heal your body, that, that he's going to give you somewhere to live, that he's going to feed you, but you keep on looking at what seems to be a closed door. God have mercy, this is good to me. Woo! Uh, uh, and so, so, so what I saw in my spirit, y'all, is that God says, you got to show me that you have faith in me by looking at a closed door and running toward it with wide open. Woo! In the nick of time. In the nick of time. In the nick of time. Woo! You can't pass up yet. You can't show God you trust him. You can't show God you trust him by by, by worrying. You can't show God you trust him by crying about everything. You got to get your feet down. You got to say, devil, here I come. That door look closed, but here I come. Woo! 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 And the nick of time, it's going to be over. God will do it. Woo! God will do it. Every time. Woo! Come on, bless God, somebody. Bless God.